Yeah. In my last video, you got the majority of my comments. Everyone said you were so handsome. Yeah. Yeah. So as you can see, we have a little visitor today. He was meowing outside the door when I was trying to film. Oh, now you don't want to be a star? Say bye. Exit stage left. Hi everybody, my name is Kim and welcome to my channel, Bookmarks and Breadsticks. Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel, Bookmarks and Breadsticks. If you're new to my channel, I focus on bookish foodie content, primarily in nonfiction, but I do tend to dab. I have a kitty who keeps biting my ankles while we're filming. Would you like to come up again? Say hi. This is Hamilton. He has made one other YouTube appearance. It is close to four, which means he's getting fed in the next hour, and he is hungry. As you can see, he is licking me. I don't really know what he wants right now, but he just doesn't want to be left out of the party. So, you can stay here as long as you want. Today, I want to talk to you about two books for another episode of my Book Duo series. This time, I'm focusing on the South and the Black experience, specifically with food. So I have two different books for you today. One is Franchise, The Golden Arches, and the other is The Cooking Gene by Michael Twitty. I want to tell you the author of Franchise, The Golden Arches, but I can't see the cover from here because I am holding this cat, so please forgive me. I will put it over here in uh, my lower thirds, or I will add a caption. Ow, do you see, do you see what he does? He just bites me. Yes, Bubba? Yes. Ow! All right, all right, sorry. Gosh, guys, well, please give my video a like and subscribe if you'd like to see more cat content. Anyway, now I can actually show you the covers of these books. This is Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America by Marcia Chatelain, the author of The South Side Girls. So this book is quite obviously about McDonald's and the role it has in post 1960s urban black America. So franchise reveals the hidden history of how ha of how fast food became one of the greatest generators of black wealth and power in America and the costs of its success story. I listened to this as an audiobook with my husband Dan when we were driving back from our wedding in Buffalo, New York. This is very historical probably a silly statement to say. It's a lot less of a straight linear story from the point of view of the author. This is very much we're going to look at each decade and talk about how McDonald's really played a role in Black America both for the best and for the worst. So I did listen to this as an audiobook this month. It's about 13 hours so it is a little bit of an investment but definitely worth it or you can pick up the book at 259 pages plus the index. I don't know what could you focus here? Thank you Cam. My camera keeps going in and out of focus. I'm not gonna stop the review. I'm too tired for that. This is another book in my efforts to diversify my reading. I'm focusing on an area that I genuinely don't know a lot about, which is the role of food in Black America. And also she is a writer of color. This book I would give, I guess I would say four out of five stars. I think it's very important and I wanna review it highly so that more people listen and or read this book because we do need to learn more about the role of food in Black America. I think it loses a star because the audiobook experience isn't that great in the sense that it's just long, it's intense. I think I might have enjoyed it as a book, which is also why I have it as a hardcover. Let me just read a, bl a blurb from the inside for you. An estimated one third of all Americans, American adults eat something from a fast food restaurant every day. Millions start their mornings with paper-wrapped English muffin breakfast sandwiches, order burritos hastily secured in foil for lunch, and end their evenings with extra-value dinners consumed in cars. But while people of all ages and backgrounds enjoy the and depend on fast food, it does not mean the same thing for each of us. For African Americans, as acclaimed historian Marcia Chatlin reveals in Franchise, fast food is a source of both despair and power. And a, battle and a battlefield on which the fight for racial justice has been waged since the 1960s. Do we have a right to blame fast food for the obesity epidemic in the United States? Absolutely. But there also is a moment where we have to look at what McDonald's did 
for black entrepreneurship and black wealth. So one of the things that the book brings to light is during you know the civil rights movement, while people wanted equality, there were some of, that believed that we need, blacks needed social and economic currency. So when McDonald's allowed black blacks to own franchises, it was a big deal. It brought, it was a big deal, but you start to understand the, the politics behind it. McDonald's wanted to take over the country. They wanted to, they wanted to get into these black communities before another franchise did, like a Burger King, for example. So they realized that their primarily white franchise owners couldn't get into these spaces because blacks didn't want them there. So they cherry picked specific black men that showed promise for upward mobility and then used that man to go around the country and promote opening black franchises. So in one sense, wow, it creates jobs and the black owner hires black people in the community, hires black kids, gets them out of gangs and etc. And you see a little bit of social and economic upward mobility. That's a positive thing. At the same time, it's really just a strategy for McDonald's to seep and spread like a spider's web into other communities. There are other parts of the book where uh, the author goes into detail about how the franchises that these black owners would take over oftentimes were in much, much worse condition than their white counterpart franchise owners. And when they needed support, they needed new furniture, they needed new equipment, they were often overlooked. On top of that, these owners were in areas that, let's say, had higher crime rate, had higher gang rates. Like, it was very, very difficult and very apparent in the book that a black franchise owner almost never existed in a white community. And if they did, the book also discusses what does it mean for a black franchise owner to live in wealth in a white community owned that works for a company that is owned by a white CEO. There's a lot about the duality and relationships that the book goes into that I can't relate to because I'm white passing, I'm Persian American, I'm not black, but it, I can understand the struggles of like, well, should I be proud that I'm rich and I have a good car and I can send my kids to college? Or should I feel like I sold out to a large corporation like McDonald's that really hasn't done anything to actually help the black community? I'm obviously paraphrasing. There's a lot of really great information in here. The book also talks about the role that the Golden Arches played as community centers, as a safe place where sometimes this was the only solid meal that certain pe black people got. And also how these territories, <laughs> Stores became territories within gang, gang wars, where groups had meetings to discuss politics. It's interesting to see almost, not glamorization, but the respect and acknowledgement that this building, this enterprise plays in politics. It's also really troubling. Because now when you think about how McDonald's sponsors the Olympics, they sponsor local baseball teams, they sponsor community involvement, a lot of that came to a front because these black franchise owners said, I don't want you, or the black community said, I don't want you in my city because you want my money. How is this going to really help us? And they're like, well, we'll bring jobs and et cetera. They're like, yeah, but I don't want just jobs. I want a park. I want a safe place for my children to go. I want good schools and good equipment. And it, it's because the black community constantly fought McDonald's and advocated with a list of demands to better their communities that you see the social outreach that, you know, McDonald's gets a lot of praise now that they're so involved in the community. Back then, they, they wanted nothing to do with it. And I really also hated McDonald's because they wouldn't, I'm not going to get involved in politics. It's not my problem. That was the attitude I got throughout the whole book. And it was just like, so you just want black franchise owners because you want to get into these communities to make money. Like, it's a bunch of shit. And it was so frustrating to read about. Now, those black owners who became franchise owners, they, they took their runway and they were going to invest in their own communities. But that was very driven by franchise to franchise owner. That was not a mission statement from McDonald's. All in all, 
four out of five. It's a really powerful book. I really, really encourage you guys to read it. I would love to have someone to talk to about it besides my husband, just to get another point of view. So let me know, you can get an audiobook version of this as well. Other book in our duos today is The Cooking Gene by Michael Twitty. This is a journey through African American culinary history in the Old South. This is a winner of the Jaden Beard Award for writing and book of the year. So I adore Michael Twitty. He's actually been on Padma Lakshmi's most recent show on Hulu called Taste of a Nation. If you want to see more interviews, he's also been on an episode of Gastropod. Yes, I just hit myself in the face with my book. He's been on an episode of Gast Gastropod, um, the podcast. I lost my train of thought, so sorry. So let me read the back of this for you. Southern food is integral to the American culinary tradition, yet the question of who owns it is one of the most provocative issues of our ongoing struggles over race. In this unique memoir, Twitty takes readers into the white hot center of this fight, tracing the roots of his own family and the charged politics surrounding the origins of soul food, barbecue, and all Southern cuisine. Five out of five. If I said four out of five earlier, I lied. Five out of five. It Obviously, for these duos, I should acknowledge this is more food history. This is a memoir. But Twitty's journey is breathtaking. It's captivating. Also, if you want the audiobook, Twitty narrates it himself, which makes it even better. I This book was on back order for such a long time, um, especially when George Floyd was murdered. This was one of the first books that sold out. I needed to get my hands on it. So I ended up listening to it as an audiobook until my physical copy could come. It was amazing. My battery is going to die. All of my batteries like just didn't charge before I started filming, so I'm an idiot. Twitty has a whole blog called Afro Culinaria, the first blog devoted to the Amer African American historic foodways and their legacies. He has been honored by First We Feast as one of the 20 greatest food bloggers of all time and named one of the 50 people who are changing the South by Southern living. I think Twitty in pop culture became famous because he tweeted after Paula Deen came out, the controversy came out that she was using the N word um, and is known as this icon of Southern cuisine. Twitty came out against her and didn't attack her for saying it, but just said, hey, let's talk. So like I thought my battery was going to die, I swear they're all just dead and miserable and I'm trying to get through this. I have actually filmed videos about Twitty before and been so frustrated because my camera kept dying. So I never ended up using that content. So Twitty is known in pop culture for coming and tweeting against Paula Deen when she was a couple of years ago in a major controversy for using the N-word. Paula Deen, Food Network, tons of butter, um, and known for Southern cuisine. Twitty, Twitty wrote this beautiful series of tweets that was really about he came to Paula and just basically said in this tweet, it's not about just you using the N-word. It's the idea that whites are taking historic, important food ways of African-American cuisine and, and saying it is theirs. It is their white Southern food. And that is not true. So much of Southern food comes from African-Americans. It comes from the slaves that we kidnapped and took from their homes and etc. And Twitty identifies this by going through his own genealogy, understanding back and back. He's a descendant of a slave and he knows that. But as he goes farther into his genealogy, what does that mean to be the child of a slave or to be born from a slave and a white man because the white man raped a woman and the genealogy continues to go back and back and back. Some of his genealogy goes back to Europe because there, there is white blood in him and etc. And his journey is painful. And what I do love is that Twitty eventually goes on a cooking tour where he reenacts and cooks traditional Southern African American cuisine using the tools that would have been available during the time of slavery. The book is fascinating. It is powerful. It is painful to read about moments where black, the children of black slaves were fed from pig troughs with the animals. That was how lowly they were considered. And it just, it's disgusting. It's horrifying to hear about. And it's stuff that we should be learning in school. My cat is biting my ankle, stop it. It's, it's a wonderful book. Listening to it narrated by Twitty just takes it to a whole other level. It's amazing. It's, 
It's amazing also later in the book as Tweety does these demonstrations and cooking tours he goes into places where he is in a room where with all whites who want to learn about the southern cooking and they have to confront face to face the history of racism that they are a part of. And it's interesting because he does touch on things like the relationship with Sean Brock. Sean Brock is a very famous southern chef who is trying to bring back heritage breeds of corn and other indigenous crops that have nearly gone extinct, extinct excuse me, in the south. And Twitty is friends with Sean Brock. They respect each other, but he also feels and comments on the idea of the white savior, the white god who is getting all this praise for his work when really there are black culinary icons that need to be, we need to raise them up. We need to give them more exposure as well. And it's a very interesting and tactful analysis. I, he doesn't attack Sean Brock. Sean Brock is part of a large, is a, a product of a larger conversation that blacks are still not given the credit they are due as chefs. Their role in southern food, not only southern food, but American cuisine in general. I know a lot of people say fried chicken belongs to the slave, it, it comes from slavery, and it does. But you know, are you thinking that when you get your Kentucky fried chicken? Did you know that food was one of gardening and cuisine was one of the few ways that slaves could fight back against their in, like their enslavement. They were lucky if they got this small plot of land and they would try and grow their own food because the rations given to them by their slave owners were so abysmal. But that was, you could only tend to your garden after working 18 hours a day in the field. And you know, you were lucky if you could go into town to buy seeds and et cetera. And Twitty just, it feels like no stone is left unturned. He visits the plantations where his ancestors lived or what's left of that land. And it's heartbreaking, but it's so fascinating is not the word, captivating. I couldn't put it down. And I felt his pain. And surprisingly, I felt his anger, but it wasn't rage. It was just his drive to want to do better, to change the, the world, to bring light to African-American cooking, the role of slavery, raising up black chefs. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. I hope he writes more. I follow him on Instagram. I think he's great. And I, five out of five, one of the best books I have read slash listened to this year. Okay, so those are the two books I covered today in our book duos, books from a black author, franchise and the cooking gene. I will link in the description below where you can pick them up through bookshop.org. And which are you, what do you think? I know that booktube we're trying to diversify our reading. Would you pick either of these up or maybe give it a listen? If you want to learn more about Twitty, like I said, check out that episode about the Gullah Gullah people on Taste of a Nation by Padma Lakshmi. That might be a really good way to get a taste of his personality before you pick up the entire book. Uh, I find him captivating even when he's on screen. That is another episode from Bookmarks and Breadsticks. Please don't forget to hit like and subscribe and leave me a comment down below. And if you want to support the channel, I have links to my Patreon and you could buy me a cup of coffee and all the funds will go towards supporting the channel and more bookish adventures. I hope you are well. Wear a mask. Black Lives Matter. Have a great day. Bye.